Uh, let me welcome everybody to uh, the School of Information 102nd birthday celebration. Um, my name is Steve Weber. It's a real honor to be here today, um, and particularly um, in this somewhat crazy year that will go down in history as one of the weirdest years that we've all experienced. Um, but really, um, to kind of change the focus for a moment to celebrate the 102 year history and particularly the extraordinary achievements and contributions of the women's leaders who have shaped the past, the present, and the future of the iSchool. Um, these people have been just an incredible part of our proud history, uh, a crucial part of our present, and of course, um, going out into the world to shape the future, not just of our school, but the society that we touch and integrate with in really important ways. And so most of what we're gonna talk about today is gonna be led um, by some of my colleagues, uh, for this purpose, but um, just before we get started, I do want to uh, offer a really quick and sincere thank you to Michael Buckland, um, who's a professor emeritus here at the iSchool, and who I've gotten to know a little bit over my 10 years here. Um, Michael, as many of you know, together with the staff of the iSchool, initiated these annual celebrations for the iSchool's history over the years. Um, rooted in the School of Librarianship and Information Studies. And we started two years ago and just wanted to thank Michael publicly for the uh, energy and enthusiasm and really the opportunity to keep so many of our friends and alumni engaged in our work today through the information access seminars that you run on Fridays and all you do in the sort of unofficial but really important role as historian of the school. And I have to say just personally now that I'm in this role of uh, associate dean and head of school, I have a deep appreciation um, for your leadership as chair of the School of Librarianship, which I know you did for eight years back in the 70s and 80s. So maybe just like a quick round of collective applause for Michael uh, before we move on. So probably the only person whose applause you're gonna hear, but uh, it's enthusiastic. And so um, over to the agenda for today, uh, before um, I turn it over to my colleague, uh, professor, and our former dean, Anno Saxinian, uh, there she is standing on the steps of South Hall. Remember the days when we used to be able to do that um, in purple? Um, it feels like 100 years ago, but really it was just like yesterday in the long history of this school. Anno is um, very appropriately honored among the dozen women leaders that we recognized in our school's online tribute to women's leaders over the course of this year. And of course, you know, we all want to acknowledge that this is hardly a comprehensive list. Um, it's just a sampling really of the community of women leaders who have been our students, our staff, our faculty members, so many really extraordinary people. Um, but we hope you'll enjoy this overview of some of the standout contributions and of course, our objective is over time to kind of expand that list um, in all sorts of ways. So please help us with that. Uh, then we'll turn it over to uh, the people who matter the most, really, my terrific faculty colleagues, um, Kamiko, Morgan, and Nilofar, um, who are going to give five-minute lightning talks on some really interesting research they're working on these days. And it's really kind of a celebration of what they're doing to serve our students, um, to build our research capacity, and to imp most importantly, really create new knowledge and practice where human beings and technology intersect in the world. And so I think those will be really interesting. Um, there are 40 and 50 minute versions of those talks I'm sure that my colleagues would like to give, um, but we're gonna do them in five minutes today. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to say as well that uh, I'm hoping that at some point in the not so distant future, we'll be able to recreate this picture with uh, folks at present. Uh, everybody remembers that beautiful staircase and lots of other things we love about South Hall. And uh, maybe absence makes the heart grow fonder, uh, but I certainly miss it. And I know everybody else does. And so I hope that we'll be able to welcome so many of the people on this call in person some point soon, maybe in 2021 or before. But before we go there, um, indulge me in just a couple of minutes of nostalgia. And I've had the opportunity to learn a little bit about what the School of Librarianship was like um, back in the fall of 1918, 102 years ago, when Berkeley first began to educate information professionals. 
and I don't know, maybe it's just one of those weird kinds of coincidences that 1918 was, of course, the Spanish flu pandemic, the height of the Spanish flu pandemic post-World War I. And I think it's kind of encouraging to remember that Berkeley as a university and the school at the time was in the throes of dealing with that pandemic. And you know that picture almost looks like it be, could be taken today uh, with a little bit of updating. Um, but to keep in mind that as difficult as the times sometimes seem right now, we have been through this kind of stuff before. And as an institution, Berkeley knows how to deal with challenges. We don't welcome them, but when they face us, we confront them. And I think we're demonstrating exactly now the same characteristics of what makes the campus and the iSchool great as the people in 1918 did um, when they had to deal with their version of the pandemic. So let me just give you the fastest possible overview of a couple of numbers um, about the iSchool today, because it's really kind of extraordinary as we think about the challenges we've been dealing with um, and tackling these new opportunities. Maybe the most important number to keep in mind is the number 900, because it's kind of amazing. We've moved um, online without really skipping a beat. We have 900 students in all in our programs. Uh, normally our PhDs and MIM students would be in person, that would be about 100. Um, but we haven't missed a beat. And with 900 students in the school now, it's sort of orders of magnitude, more interesting, more wonderful, and more impactful than we've been able to do in the past. And so um, we've been keeping ourselves pumped up in these difficult times by just sort of remembering what we call the three R's that are crucial to iSchool success. The first R is ready. And just to be honest, I mean, our students and our faculty were better prepared than just about anybody else on the Berkeley campus and really better prepared than almost any other university in the country for moving online. And that was in very large part to Anno's prescience when she was Dean in starting the master's in data science program um, and doing it in the online environment where it could reach so many more people than we would have been able to reach if we had kept it within the physical confines of South Hall. We didn't intend for it to be a program for a pandemic, but boy, have we been able to take advantage of that. And as you'll see, we now have the largest entering class of mid students that we've ever had. Um, partly a function of the fact that we know how to do online education better than almost anybody else. We've also started working with Berkeley undergrads to transfer some of that knowledge directly into what we call our fifth year mids program. And you can see some of those people doing something um, in the past that hopefully we'll be able to do again in the future, which is called having lunch together. Um, those are our fifth year Berkeley undergrads who are getting masters just as they enter the iSchool before they finish their degree at Berkeley. So that's the ready R. The second R is resilient. And for me, that's first and foremost a kind of mindset that has really kind of permeated the faculty, the staff, the students, and kept us all together through this period where we've had to adopt, excuse me, we've had to adapt. And so, for example, we've adapted to a new challenge in the world by using our research skills um, to do capstone projects about COVID, to do research projects around the social and technology implications of what it means to live through a pandemic. Um, all the things that people are confronting around the world here in California, in the United States, and of course on the campus. I think it's really extraordinary and it's quite an honor to see the way in which so many of our colleagues have kind of redirected pieces of what they do to try to make a contribution to this crucial moment that we're all trying to navigate as best we can. And then the third R is sort of an expansion of that and it's about relevance. Um, one of the things that attracted me to the iSchool was that in addition to being an academic research institution, it's a research and teaching institution that is just absolutely committed to making a concrete difference in the way the world works outside the halls of the university. And so our expertise here at the intersection of technology and humanity and our history of looking at places where those issues intersect, like today, inequality and algorithmic decision-making, public policy around privacy, 
this all has sort of informed our capacity to meet some of the really most important challenges that good people are facing now in 2020 and that we're going to face beyond 2020. Um, of course, that now includes a really deep and renewed commitment to make progress on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion couldn't be more crucial in the industry to which many of our graduates enter. And so it couldn't be more crucial for us as well um, to think about how the work we do can be used to combat systemic racism in places where technology touches human society. Super relevant and really important to the people who form the virtual community that we now call South Hall. And so one last sort of substantive area to just comment, comment on, it's an area of special interest and passion to, for me. Um, as our librarian alumni are well aware as future, or excuse me, fellow information professionals, digital security has never been more important and challenging than it is today. Um, many of my colleagues say it feels like we've gone through something like 10 years of digital transformation in something like 10 weeks or 10 months. And of course, that's created all sorts of new challenges for maintaining security when digital technology touches some of the most intimate aspects of human behavior. And so consistent with that, we graduated our first small cohort in our new Masters in Information and Cybersecurity um, program. This was from early January. And uh, obviously, that's uh, something of great pride for us to be able to expand to another online degree program that's been growing steadily um, and meshing, of course, with our research agenda, our on-campus teaching, and in particular with a group that I'm really particularly proud of called Citizen Clinic, which is a both a, a clinical course, a research program, and an outreach institution that aims to improve the digital security of civil society organizations in a world that's becoming really hostile to their ability to operate online. So um, that's my update. And uh, if you have questions for me, I'm more than glad to take them um, in the question and answer box as we wrap up later. Uh, but for really the most important part and the substantive part of the program, I want to turn it over to my longtime colleague, collaborator, friend, and the person who used to be my boss, um, Anna Saxinian. Thanks, Anna. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Uh, you're not my boss now, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to join today uh, and reflect on what a long way we've come, both as a university and as, as a school. Um, women were admitted to UC Berkeley a year after the campus opened in 1869. And although women had access to higher education, at least white women, uh, it would take 40 more years before women secured the right to vote in 1911. But I think you're gonna see um, from a short, this short presentation that women have been uh, absolutely central to the iSchool, what we now call the iSchool, starting with the School of Librarianship, uh, at, in shaping both it, you know, its research, its teaching, its vision of the future. So it was in 1911 that Edith Coulter became a senior assistant librarian at UC Berkeley, uh, starting a 52 year long career here. Um, ending as the first female acting chair of the school. Uh, before I go any further, you should, you should, I'm gonna profile several uh, women, many women, but there's many more that I'm not gonna profile. Uh, so please um, spend some time visiting the link in the chat box uh, that one of the staff has, has provided to read about even more wonderful women at the school. Um, Okay, uh, we've also got a picture here of Eliza Atkins Gleason. Uh, she deserves special recognition because in 1936, she earned an MA in library science, which for black women at the time was really remarkable. She became a very important figure in making libraries more accessible to people of color across the state. Uh, she wrote a book called uh, The Southern Negro and the Public Library in 1941 advocating for desegregation of libraries. Uh, very much ahead of her time, as we'll see all of the women that we profile have been. Um, in the 1960s and 1970s, our school continued to benefit from the leadership of women pioneers, uh, and especially women committed to diversity uh, and equity and inclusion. Um, 
So Anne Lippau uh, on the left um, had a 30 year career with the university library uh, and also launched our first trainings on using the internet for librarians. She also saw, oversaw reports on the status of women employees and librarian salary inequities that were renowned and groundbreaking. Um, we also have here Judy Young and Faye Blake, also pioneers. Judy was a librarian leading the Chinatown Library in San Francisco and as the founder of the Asian American Studies program at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, and then Faye for her work supporting marginalized groups and promoting field studies as an agent for social change. Amazing. I didn't even know about these women until uh, we started preparing this. Um, okay, bring, bringing us closer to the present, uh, Nancy Van House, who is both an alumni from our school, a former faculty member, and led the school as a chair from 1991 to 1995. She provided uh, a lot of reassurance and support to me as I began my deanship ages ago. Um, Okay, Beverly French. Uh, she, Beverly is an alumna who dedicated her career to the UC system and to the state of California, serving for years as the director of shared content, or in her words, shared content. Um, as a student, she also received the um, Sidney B. Mitchell Scholarship, which is awarded for merit, and we're so grateful that she continues to support scholarship to serve future generations uh, of students today. I hope you'll also take time to read uh, with interest about Alfreda Chapman, who took an ethnographic approach to information studies, another one of the uh, con continuities uh, from the past to the present. Ethnography is very much present in the work that many of our women faculty do today. Um, also, uh, well, Rosaria Gasol de Horowitz, um, who brought an important global lens to the school. I am um, also want to uh, highlight two women who were there at the beginning of the SIMS, the School of Information Management and Systems, who were, these two women were critical in shaping the curriculum uh, and the vision of, of the school uh, at, that we know as the iSchool today. Um, Pam Samuelson, who is uh, a pioneer in digital copyright law, intellectual property, and law and information policy. Her curriculum shaped many of our students. Um, she is also in the law school and, and the founder of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. Uh, Marty Hurst, whose ideas and curriculum and vision also have really fundamentally shaped the school. Her re research has moved from uh, text mining and analysis, which we today would call computational linguistics, um, user interfaces for search, information visualization, and most recently, uh, she has been uh, doing work on teaching at large scale, which is particularly relevant for the online uh, environment that we seem to be in today. Okay, and I'm really excited to recognize Holly Liu. Uh, she is the, um, I remember her as a student and have been really proud to follow her success. She was a co-founder of a company called Kabam, as well as multiple other enterprises, um, but I'm also, tremendously appreciative of Holly because she has stayed deeply engaged in the school as an advisor to me, as a supporter, uh, and she's helping to mentor and fund student teams we'll be working with uh, in early 2021 on startup concepts for a course that I'm going to be teaching, co-teaching, uh, called Entrepreneurship New Venture Discovery. I'm really grateful for Holly's support. Um, obviously, Dana Boyd, uh, has been one of the highest profile of our women alums, uh, has written about, uh, she was writing about social media before many of us knew about it, and especially from the perspective of understanding the inequities and the sources of bias in, in data and in technology. Um, Dana, uh, Dana it continues to amaze all of us. Um, okay, our final trio, no less distinguished, a bit younger maybe, uh, or, or more recent, um, Deirdre Mulligan, uh, who graces our current faculty and has been a really important faculty leader on the campus, first as the faculty director of the, uh, well, the, the, um, the law clinic at, at the law school. She's now a faculty director at the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. And she also started or co-started the Algorithmic Fairness and Opacity Group, 
uh, and she was there at the, also at the Center for Long, founding of the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. Um, Deirdre's uh, teaching uh, and her research on privacy have influenced many, many students who are out there today doing amazing things. Um, we also have Sharon Lynn. Sharon is um, a more recent. She was in our first cohort of data science uh, graduates. Um, she distinguished herself very early, earning the peer nomination to be um, the commencement speaker of the first MIDS graduation. Um, and since then, she has become, uh, well, she's been a very successful data scientist, I should say, but she's also been very uh, active in supporting and mentoring our current data science students. Um, and directly supporting the new generations through her philanthropy. Sharon, um, we miss you. <laughs> um, and then finally, last but not least, Elaine Seddenberg, the most recent graduate, was recruited. She, she finished our PhD program and was recruited directly from uh, the PhD to run uh, the global privacy and policy group for Facebook. Um, she was also a key actor uh, and continues to be, I would say, in the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity uh, and has remained engaged with the school uh, since she graduated in 2019. Again, these are people we should expect to see many great things into the future. Um, last but obviously not least, I, I want to recognize Jennifer Chase as the lead of our new Division of Computing, Data Science and Society. Um, the school is, of course, a part of that division. Uh, Jennifer arrived at a very tumultuous time on campus, um, but helped kick off this year with a big gift, in fact, the largest gift in Berkeley's history. Um, and we hope her work with the head of our school will open new doors for growth and opportunity uh, in the future. Um, okay, I want to alert now, I've been asked to alert everyone watching now, uh, that if you'd like to be part of the 150th uh, celebration of women on the campus, you can upload a photo and the information is on the slide that will be coming up shortly. Uh, yes, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure where the, that will be, but it will be provided to you, I'm sure, maybe in a link box. Um, okay, now the thing that we've all been waiting for. Um, I want to turn it over to my three uh, fantastic faculty colleagues. Um, we want to celebrate today the work that they're doing to serve our students and to drive really important research at the School of Information. Um, here's the order that they'll present uh, and the titles of their talks. Um, I, I guess I'd like to um, ask, save questions until the end and I'll moderate them. So if you have questions, feel free to put them into the Q&A box. Uh, first, we'll hear from Kamiko Riakai. Kamiko will give a talk called The Impact of VR head-mounted displays on children's empathic perspective taking during collaborative design tasks. Uh, then Morgan Ames will give a talk called Theorizing Silicon Valley Cultures and Countercultures. And last but certainly not least, Mila Farsalehi will present What Theories of Justice Teach Us About Real World Information Systems. Okay, over to you, Kamiko. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for this opportunity to share my work. Um, my name is Kimiko Ryokai. Uh, my background is in linguistics, psychology, and interaction design. I design and evaluate embodied tangible user interfaces that enable people to interact with abstract concepts in concrete ways. Today, I wanted to share uh, one of my projects, which is called VR Sandscape. I'm going to take a uh, play video, which is a physical sandbox um, augmented with a depth sensing camera, a projector, and VR. Kids take turns building the model uh, with physical sand, as well as wearing a VR headset to experience their ongoing design. The VR view is shown in that LCD screen. Um, I've conducted a study with middle school children pre-pandemic, um, studied kids um, in this environment and compared it with um, another group using the same uh, system, but without the VR headset. Um, some uh, highlights from the VR group. Children working at the sandbox were really busy continuously shifting their attention between the sandbox, the LCD, and their physical partner. 
the children wearing the VR headset experienced their ongoing design from inside and communicated opportunity for design improvements with their partner, like, oh, this is way too steep or too narrow. Um, kids at the sandbox uh, therefore immediately modified their physical model to incorporate new design features. The working hands at the sandbox became part of the virtual terrain. The virtual hand could push the VR child inside intentionally or accidentally. So this led the kids to be careful with differences between their sizes, as well as to be aware of the differences between how the maze looked from the perspective of the designer versus a possible future users of their maze. Um, and the non-VR group worked in the same exact environment, but without the VR headset. Um, kids noticed the change in scenery on the LCD, but they were busy focusing on the work um, on the sandbox model. Um, they waited to finish their maze and then explored um, it using controller and LCD view, but without the immersive VR headset. They enjoyed seeing their design from another perspective, but they did not change their design as if their design were complete. Over multiple sessions, VR Group's design incorporated more accessible features such as gentle slopes and wider path and overall became simpler over time. Non-VR groups design remained intricate with many twists and turns. Their design approach was consistent over multiple sessions. VR group was more critical about their design, wanting to make more changes. Non-VR groups was more satisfied with their design and felt their design more complete. So in a design activity, it is important to be able to take um, another's perspective because um, design is about making something for someone. It's important, especially for children who are learning to move from egocentric perspective to allocentric perspective, being able to see things from others' perspective or object to object perspective. In a hybrid environment like VR Sandscape, these different views of how things appear from my perspective versus others get quite complex. But it is exactly this messy process of making sense of negotiating different perspectives in a collaborative design process that I'm currently investigating. Especially a technology like VR immersive view can enable such increased encounters with multiple perspectives. Thank you very much and stop sharing. Now I believe Morgan. Alrighty, can you hear me okay? Great. Um, thank you very much for, whoops, skipped ahead a little bit. There we go. Um, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Um, my larger research agenda focuses on um, theorizing Silicon Valley cultures and countercultures. And um, this is within the context of, this is a, a picture of, um, you know, part of Silicon Valley and the highlights are actually all of the, uh, the Superfund sites across, <laughs> across the south end of the valley. Um, and I focus on um, how you know, the various industrial practices in Silicon Valley um, do more than just produce products in the world, right? They really change the way we work, we play, how we value ourselves, how we value others. Um, and they really shape not only how we live, but how we think we should live, right? So they, they give us a kind of moral vision. Um, my own goal here is to describe this moral vision and to relate it to past alternatives, current alternatives, and um, you know, the many contradictory and complementary visions from um, elsewhere around the world. So this is part of a larger project that I'm part of called Seeing Like a Valley. Um, 
This is bringing together scholars and policymakers, technologists, journalists, media creators, um, artists, all sorts of great people, activists um, from around UC Berkeley, and also a number of nearby institutions and people from all around the world. And together, we really want to understand the role of, quote unquote, the valley, of course, as a place, but also as an idea, and how it shapes not just these new technologies, but these moral visions, and then how those visions kind of get exported around the world. Um, my own part of this project focuses on how the technology world, um, you know, kind of creates, whoops, sorry, there's a Zoom thing that keeps popping up, uh, creates various and replicates um, a certain kind of homogeneity and certain moral blind spots um, that are kind of, you know, over of this, have this uh, framework of an exclusionary ideology. And um, I focus in particular on how discourses about childhood, including both kind of personal memories, the stories people tell about their own childhoods, and the kind of broader ideals of childhood more generally factor into this. So in um, last year, last uh, November, I published a book on this topic, although not so much focused on Silicon Valley, this tied in MIT uh, cultures. And it was called The Charisma Machine, Life, Death, and Legacy of One Laptop Per Child. And I used One Laptop Per Child um, as a kind of case study to try to explain why the same kinds of utopian visions that inspired One Laptop or Child still motivate a lot of other projects trying to use technology to quote unquote disrupt education and uh, development. Um, this project is one that's grounded in ethnography, but it also has a historical component. It goes back 50 years into the past and then takes me to Paraguay to, to try to kind of look at, you know, what the allure of um, technology hype, like was associated with one laptop or child, and um, and then the problems that result from these kinds of projects. Oops, there we go. So. Um, just a little bit about One Laptop Per Child. This project was announced in 2005 by MIT Media Lab co-founder Nicholas Negroponte, but it was really the brainchild of late Media Lab professor Seymour Papert. Um, and the project promised to transform the lives of children all across the global south with this small, sturdy, and cheap laptop computer, which was originally going to be powered by a hand crank. So in reality, this lap, this project fell short in a number of ways, starting with the hand crank, which was infeasible to actually produce, um, and the price tag, which was which stubbornly remained um, at least double, approximately, the $100 target. The, but even so, the project remained charismatic to so many who were really enchanted by its claims of access to educational opportunities that had been supposedly previously out of reach. So behind its promises, OLPC, like a lot of technology projects that make similarly grand claims, had a kind of fundamentally flawed vision of who the computer was made for and what role technology should play in learning. So I, um, in addition to kind of exploring this history, I drew on a seven month study of a model OLPC project in Paraguay. Um, I spent six months in 2010, another month in 2013 as follow up. And I explored how, when these laptops were in use, the charisma that attracted so many in the tech world to the project didn't really translate. Um, the laptops were not only frustrating to use, easy to break and hard to repair, most importantly, they were designed for what I call technically precocious boys. And these were idealized younger versions of many of the developers themselves, rather than the diverse range of children who might actually use them. So over the summer, I was very honored to learn that um, the Charisma Machine was awarded Best Information Science Book of the Year, which is great. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, I'm giving a number of virtual book talks through the fall. So, um, so I'm, I'm always happy to have people join for those. Um, the next project, though, I'm, I'm looking at kind of extends some of these questions I ask in the Charisma Machine regarding the interaction between humans, ideology, and identity to explore the role that utopianism plays in discourses around childhood, around education, and around development um, in two geographically overlapping but ultra ultimately kind of culturally divided worlds. So this is kind of developer culture of Silicon Valley, the tech world, high tech world, and then the working class and immigrant communities of the San Francisco Bay area. 
um, as one part of this, I'm tracking shifts in what I'm calling developer origin stories. These are the stories that various kinds of tech workers tell about um, how they decided to go into tech um, and then the broader cultural influences those stories reflect. And on the other side, I'm studying and in some cases running, as I did with Jenna Burrell, one of our other wonderful instructor uh, professors here in the school, um, summer camps for youth from demographics that are traditionally marginalized from the tech world to explore their experience and perception of, of tech and the industry. So uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to have had the opportunity to give you a little glimpse into, into my own interests. Thank you so much, Morgan. Um, can everyone see my slides? All right. Um, I just wanted to thank Shanti, Tia, Gary, um, Steve, and Anno for organizing this. It's just been really interesting and amazing to see all this great work. Today I'm going to share very briefly some of the work that my group is doing in um, a lab that I've launched in the iSchool over the past two years called TO3, which stands for Tech of One's Own. Um, it's a nod, of course, to a room of one's own. Um, and if we're thinking about technology by and for the communities it impacts and thinking about how do we imagine alternative worlds um, that we would want to live in and how do we try to understand the technologies and their impacts that we have today. Uh, my own background is in um, human computer interaction. And another one of the things that I wanted to do was really today highlight the work of our amazing PhD students um, who are doing this work. So I'm going to talk about basically two theories of justice and what they teach us about information systems in the real world. And the first um, theory of justice is restorative justice. So this is, um, came through us thinking about the different kinds of online harms that exist in social spaces, things like harassment, abuse, stalking, um, sharing of revenge porn, things like that. And what kinds of technological or social re reactions and responses we have for those. And through studying those, we found that a lot of the ways that platforms and, and everyone else in general thought about online harm was around content moderation. So thinking about the content as what is doing the harm and then a question of whether or not that content should be removed as the only response. But if we take a bit, step back and think through a framework based on restorative justice, restorative justice um, asks us instead to center the people who have been harmed when a harm happens and asks how justice might be restored to them, meaning how might the harm be repaired, how might relationships be repaired, what are the needs of the people who have been harmed, and how might we address them. So this is um, some of the work we've been doing. Within schools, um, say in Oakland, restorative justice has been really impactful. They, in Oakland high schools, it has dropped um, detention rates to zero, uh, where the process is that when a student harms someone else or does something that the community does not like, they go through this process of communication, using communication as a main tool for action and trying to understand, trying to help that person who has caused the harm understand what harm they've done and how can they help repair it. Um, of course, those same processes cannot easily be translated online, um, and that's a lot of what the work that we're doing here is, is trying to understand what are the ways people are harmed online, what are their needs after they've been harmed, and how might we address those. So this is work that my PhD student, Sijia Xiao, has been working on. We also won um, an NSF Early Career Award um, to continue doing this work. The second um, system that I'm going to talk about today is one where distributive justice um, has been really influential. So you might know that all around the US, most cities used um, neighborhoods to decide which, school, which students can go to which schools. And in cities like San Francisco and New York City, where there's really high residential segregation, that often translates to really high segregation within schools. And San Francisco Unified School District has been dealing with this problem for decades and using lots of different methods to try to address it. And one of the most recent ones is um, the use of algorithms that are proven theoretically to be strategy proof and efficient and give people equal access. So basically what happens is that each family, you may have already experienced this if you have um, children who go to, to school in Oakland or San Francisco, each family submits their preference list for what schools they want to go to. It can be any school in the city. Um, the city, the school district 
uh, gathers all of those preferences and assigns students to schools in a way that uh, maximizes everyone's first choice. The goal being that hopefully this will result in more equity of opportunity. What has actually happened is that that has not happened. Um, San Francisco Unified School District about a year ago voted to stop using the algorithm altogether because it was extremely confusing. There were really long waiting times and it had actually not had an impact on segregation at all. In fact, it had increased segregation to the point where now you had schools that were more segregated than the neighborhoods they were in. So there's been a lot of effort in trying to understand why, and this is the main purpose of this project. We've been doing, study, we've been studying the market design literature that created these algorithms to understand what values they were trying to achieve. We've been studying policy documents by the schools. We've been doing interviews with parents and school district members. Um, and we've came to this um, understanding that what really went wrong was that the algorithm was based on assumptions that were not true. like that people know what their preferences are and they just need to report it. They don't, and it's actually a really heavy information task that, um, that families who don't have as much resources can't do as easily. Um, it was also based on um, some of the other ideas around strategy proofness are based on trust in the system, which isn't, doesn't always exist. And finally, that there would be competition between schools that was based on quality. What actually ended up happening was that we found that schools were heavily based on social signaling and stereotyping. So now that we've understood more about what the actual context on the ground is, we're doing a project with um, Oakland Unified School District to try to better understand um, in partnership with the school district and the education department at Berkeley um, to better understand how these might be redesigned to work better. And this is work that won a New Horizons Award um, just a month ago at the Mar Mechanism Design for Social Good um, conference, which is really a conference for people who design these algorithms. Um, and we won an award for New Horizons because we brought in new methods and understandings for what these things actually look like on the ground. So just to wrap up, um, these were two of the works that two of my students have been working on. I have two new PhD students who are starting this year at the school. Um, and I'm just really fortunate to be able to work with these amazing women and future leaders. Um, I just wanted to point out that I got my PhD two years ago in computer science at Stanford and I was one of only four women in the entire cohort of 40 PhD students. Um, and I'm just really amazed every day by the environment that the iSchool creates where um, these amazing women can do, do really groundbreaking and important work. And I'm just fortunate that I get to mentor them. Thank you. Okay, we are now at the time uh, when we are gonna entertain questions and answers for our panelists. Um, I wanna say that um, one of our uh, junior, uh, one of the women faculty who we hope to uh, feature today, Jenna Burrell, was unable to do it because classic women's situation, her childcare fell through. Um, and I'm sorry we couldn't get Jenna. She's an ethnographer who, who did amazing work uh, in her early career on um, technology in Africa um, and has now started doing work on the rural internet and on um, what we would call the um, digital divide in the past in, you know, in advanced economies. Um, she, uh, I, I'm sorry she couldn't be here, but we'll have to feature her in some other opportunity. Um, the time is now uh, for all of you in the audience to ask questions of our panelists. Um, we, you can uh, ask questions in the comment box or the chat box or in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'd love to get some questions um, from any and all of you. I'm not, I guess, is anybody seeing anybody, any questions yet? Um, not yet. Um, Kimiko, why don't I start with a question for you? Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, what you want to do next with this really interesting work on VR? Um, I, I just loved your, your video and, and I'm curious, I'm always curious about where you're going next with your work. Yeah, so it seemed like um, the VR, um, although it's a first person immersive view, um, is giving this additional allocentric perspective seeing things from um, the other's perspective. 
Um, and over time, kids seem to have more empathy towards the actual user of uh, the of the designed object. And um, I would love to first also study how this also apply to um, adult adult uh, collaboration or adult children perspective uh, collaborations. Um, and then um, really see different kinds of design as well. And it, it was limited to this particular uh, maze modeling um, tasks, but what other kinds of um, um, design project that this could be applied to um, as well. Um, but it, there is a, a certain challenge at this moment to be able to study a uh, physical, tangible user interfaces. So it's, a, it's a, a, another challenge that I think all my students and my colleagues working in the area of physical interfaces are facing, but it's also a great time to be creative um, and um, collab yeah. collaborating and expanding. Yeah. One of the challenges of COVID that I hadn't even thought of, those people that do tangible interfaces. Um, Morgan, I have a question for you too. Um, you, um, you spoke very eloquently at the beginning about the way that Silicon Valley has uh, influenced people way beyond its boundaries, certainly in the US, but really in the world, from India to Europe to everywhere. Um, I'm curious what you think now, we're in a very different period. Before it was hype about entrepreneurship and the successes and everybody wanted to be the next Steve Jobs or whatever. Now we're in a period that I would, you know, has been glibly named the tech lash. Uh, and there's a lot of, um, you know, criticism, disgust, um, anxiety about Silicon Valley. Can you say a bit about how that may influence the rest of the world as well? Yeah, um, well, I, and I think there are a few different angles on this, um, on the, the tech lash that I find a particularly interesting. Um, one is that there's a shift in this moral vision of the Valley itself, right? Like there is much more willingness than five years ago. And especially if we think back to kind of the ideology that was set in place in the 90s and that kind of rode through um, uh, much of the early 2000s um, around collective organizing. I mean, this was like anathema to, <laughs> to so much of like what Silicon Valley stood for. And it's not to say it didn't happen, right? But it was really, really frowned upon by so many of the kind of rank and file tech workers and that's shifting. And I'm really interested to see what that shift means, not only in the Valley, but around the world. And I think that that is um, potentially a really a really powerful shift. I, I really hope that it has a really good influence on the world. I think there has also been a shift um, with this tech lash towards like tech for social good, AI for, so, you know, fill in the blank for social good. And um, I'm a little more worried about this, actually. I think that in its, um, uh, on the surface, at least, it sounds really positive. Um, the way it generally gets implemented, though, is to really recreate all, many of the problematic aspects of, of the industry. Um, you know, it, it tends to value voices from within tech. Um, it tends to value pretty already powerful voices in tech. I mean, I think we see this in the, you know, the recent documentary that came out, The Social Dilemma, right? Who is it that's being interviewed? It's not people like us who have studied this for, in some cases, decades, right? It's some former tech workers who have, you know, no, as far as I can tell, um, you know, no social science training, no kind of critical perspectives. Um, and it's not that they can't critique the industry. It's that, you know, the way that it often gets done um, is very simplistic and kind of reinforces the, well, in change has to come from within the industry itself, right? Like the techies are the smartest people in the room. They're the ones who are going to come up with these solutions. And that I feel like um, isn't a change, unfortunately. It's, it's a reframing of the same kinds of things. And I worry that that's just going to kind of retrench the boundaries around the tech space. So, so we'll see kind of which, <laughs> you know, which side. I, I have some hopes, but also some con concerns going forward. Yeah, you know, I, on that point, I, I read a, a column by a woman who, you know, there are all these groups around the world, around the country, certainly in the world, working on issues of equity and inclusion, and all sorts of, 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 you know, issues that are only coming up now in Silicon Valley, but they certainly are not getting recognized for this work in the trenches for decades. Yeah, um, absolutely. So we need to broaden the conversation. Um, well, Nilafar, here, I have a question for you. So, uh, um, 
was your work, how do you think your work was influenced by the experience of restorative justice uh, in South Africa, which I think initially, uh, uh, under apartheid, of course, um, or after apartheid, um, initially was con very controversial uh, and now maybe has changed. Um, can you say a bit about that? Yes, happy to. So the thing about restorative justice, the more I looked into it, the more I learned that there's very little um, consolidation where you can say this is restorative justice. It's practiced by many different people in many different kinds of ways, some of which I find extremely problematic as well, um, some of which I feel better about. Um, the kinds that I have been thinking a lot about are the, the type of restorative justice practiced a lot in schools. Um, uh, is, Oakland is a great example. Oakland Unified School District has been pushing on that. The Obama administration um, did a review of uh, racial injustices in, school, in schools, and one of the major findings that they had was to move more towards these models where the goal isn't necessarily to punish someone, which uh, can have really outsized um, impacts on different kinds of students, uh, you know, the school to prison pipeline, um, but instead to try to understand where students are coming from, try to involve them as community and try to help um, both people who are harmed and people who have done harm to understand what harm does and how it might be repaired. Um, I also find this extremely, um, it, it gives me a lot of hope um, when I see this for children and, and school children in particular, because I feel like this is at the age at which a lot of our understandings of harm are being shaped and what must be done when we do harm someone. And so some of the work that Sijia, my student, has been working on is actually in gaming communities where we're seeing these really um, young children entering these gaming communities with ex where there are extremely toxic cultures um, where racism and sexism and you know swearing at each other is the norm and that's what they learn um, and then we basically give them no other mechanism to deal with that when they are harmed or when they harm someone else um, so that's the that's mostly the practice of restorative justice that i've been building on for this work great thank you so much um, i have a question now uh, for Morgan, from Marcia Bates. Uh, she says, I'd like to know more about the attitudes of the marginalized groups towards Silicon Valley. Yeah, sure. I mean, these are, so I've, I've done some research, uh, again, with Jenna Burrell up in Richmond, California, also some in East Palo Alto, Redwood City, um, and some in Oakland as well. And this is, you know, interviewing kids and their families, running summer camps, attending various camps, and, um, and kind of, you know, doing... Uh, field work with, uh, with families, kind of observations in home. And um, I mean, a lot of them do have interactions with, you know, the, the tech world in various ways. A lot of them know people who work in the tech world. Some of them might work as, um, you know, packagers for Blue Apron. There was their, their, you know, their warehouse is up in Richmond, California. And so I met a few um, people who have family members who worked there, or they maybe work, um, you know, in uh, catering in a tech company or something like that. So a lot of people have some visibility into it. But, um, but they, you know, the, uh, the other way around, I think many people who work in the tech world, especially people who didn't grow up here, end up with a very kind of narrow slice of, of Bay Area life, right? A very narrow vision of what the Bay Area is all about. And they mostly interact with their coworkers. Um, or, you know, if they went to school here, maybe people that, uh, that they know from their classes. And um, in a lot of cases, they're you know, they may not even really be aware of the existence of some of these other neighborhoods. It's, it's really kind of interesting to talk with them about it. So I would say there's a kind of selectively permeable space between them that is, that is kind of goes one way, but really doesn't go the other way very, very easily. Thank you. Um, Kamiko, here's another question for you. Um, what do we know about um, either measured or expected differences between how people about how people of different ages um, might behave differently in, in the experiment you did. Are these findings um, distinctive? These other you know about other regarding design distinctive to children? Yeah, I think there is some developmental trend. Um, so younger children, of course, um, have more tendency to developmentally um, rely on the egocentric perspective. And I think it's more of the life uh, learning process. I think even as adults, we're constantly learning to, to 
take another perspective and and see you know how how um, um, from what it seems like from my perspective is interpreted and um, constantly um, fostering that skill to take multiple perspectives and um, so um, middle school children I think it was an interesting um, age group because they they are capable but they have the t tendency still um, might be to rely more on the egocentric so um, but again in the process like design which does involve um, not just creating something for for oneself but seeing the uh, multiple uses in different contexts um, is something that's uh, less studied. Um, there are studies of um, empathy, growing empathy in, in virtual reality, but um, so I'm um, currently trying to apply that in the activity, like the creative uh, creative activities, such as um, uh, designing some uh, physical object um, for someone. It looks like there's a follow-up question from Laura Montini um, to you, Kimiko. Uh, she says, I noticed the focus on age two. For all, is it any coincidence, do you think, that a thread running through each of your studies, and this is to you, Morgan, and also Nilafar, um, uh, is that they involve younger people? Why that focus? Um, do you want to start that, Morgan, or? Go ahead. If you, if you want to, <laughs> if you have a word, I'm happy to add a bit, but. Yeah, um, I, I think um, just as, gen as a general trend, um, VR used to be a very expensive uh, research objects, but with the prolification and um, there are some research that, that that says that the the effect of you know vision through the VR is unknown yet. So currently, it's for uh, thirteen years old and up, but um, but it's definitely reaching more of everyday life of children um, and. Um, um, I, I um, certainly, uh, in my own work, I just kept finding these stories of childhood became these kind of important markers. And so I, I ended up kind of honing in on childhood. I do think, though, that um, the, you know, the role of children and uh, in childhood in, in tech worlds is important, right? I mean, I think this is heightened right now when so many of our children, if you have, if you have younger children, school-aged children, they're doing school online or they're likely doing school online, right? So um, I think a lot of people are thinking about this now. Um, and, you know, I feel very fortunate to be in a school where we have a lot of expertise and experience going back. I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of a, a PhD student of um, Jenna Burrell's, um, but who I've also so kind of help advise over the years. Um, Ann Jonas, who has her whole dissertation project is on online schooling. And like, what is a more, more prescient, important topic right now, right? Uh, I feel like we're in such a great position to kind of jump in in all of these ongoing debates. Great. Yeah, and uh, for me, I think it was a bit random. So um, when we started the work on restorative justice, it was not I mean, I still don't think that it's majorly about young people. Um, a lot of the work that we did was looking at issues of um, revenge porn and, and mass harassment, um, those things that were quite prevalent on the internet. And then we started looking for communities that we could actually start engaging with more heavily and try to practice some of these. And so Sitja Chow, my students, started interviewing um, people and then she came to me at one point and said, we have a problem. I figured out that this a group that I've been talking to, a lot of them are below 18 years old. And we didn't even know that, but that um, that resulted and we had to go and do an amendment to the IRB and everything. But um, it just happened by chance that we found the, the group that was really receptive. Um, the moderators were really receptive to trying out new things was um, a gaming group with lots of very young people. Um, and that's when also I started thinking about how important it actually is that these people's you know, frameworks of justice is and harm is getting shaped at such a young age. So part of, of the project are with younger people, but not necessarily all of it. Um, okay, I've been alerted that there are some questions in the Q&A uh, that I wasn't noticing. So um, here's a question, uh, another one for you, Nilafar. Any insight into what about the school choice algorithm resulted in more segregated schools? Yes, this is a really good question. And, and what we will go went in to try to understand as well, because 
theoretically, if anyone can send their kid to any school, then shouldn't more people want to go to, you know, the best schools or the top schools? Um, what we found was that, you know, there, San Francisco also has a history of busing. Um, and to imagine that you could take that away and just replace it with a theoretical guarantee of equity of access was just not right because most people didn't have the access to transportation because um, we also don't have very good public transportation infrastructure. So if parents didn't have a car or didn't have time to, to transport kids, then they would end up with, their, with a school closer to their home that they could walk to and other people who could transport their kids maybe ended up with a school that they thought was higher quality but maybe Maybe it was further away. So that was one of the reasons. Another was that heavily, heavily stereotyped schools um, where, you know, a school, it, people think of a school as what is the racial um, makeup of the students in the school. And that's one of the big factors that they decide to where to send their kid. Um, so that also, um, you know, that also means that for people who are of minor, who are minorities, um, might not want to send their school their kid to a school where there are not a lot of people of the same race. Um, so, for instance, people told us that um, I don't want if if I'm black, I don't want to send my kid to a white school where maybe the teachers are not aware of how they should um, treat my child, or maybe they don't have as many peers. Um, so, all of those had an impact, um, and unfortunately, the impact is really. Um, a horrible one in the long term because what ends up happening is that the school district distributes resources based on attendance. So you had these schools that are come to be known stereotypically as, you know, schools for racial minorities um, that people st stop going to after a while. And as attendance falls, the school can't just pick itself up and start doing better because it also starts receiving less and less resources. Um, so they go into this downward spiral of um, the school really struggling to keep up um, and the assignment mechanism only you know, makes that worse. So what's really one of my key takeaways is that when you have this really complex um, social political problem with these histories of segregation and inequality, you have to be really, really careful about what these theoretical guarantees that you think are gonna result in more equity are actually going to do on the ground. Okay, here, here's a, a couple of questions that, that actually flow, are quite related. Um, the digital world creates the potential for exponential reach and at the same time reduced interpersonal sensibility. This creates new social dynamics, which can be negative as we know at times. Um, how do you suggest creating positive social values in an increasingly digital world? Anyone that's open to all of you. Happy to, to take a stab at it. It's a big question. And of course, it's a it's in itself is a research topic of so many of all of our colleagues. Um, but, you know, very briefly, I think a lot of people are looking at um, the ways that certain values get embedded in systems by kind of what they enable, right, the de what the defaults are. Um, you know, one thing that I try to teach students, and I think this also addresses Richmond's question a little bit, is to really think carefully about the kinds of um, defaults that they build into a system, right? How do people learn about one another in a system? What kinds of assumptions can they make about one another in a system? Um, are those assumptions helpful or harmful? What kinds of things can we build in that will um, kind of broaden empathy? And I think Nilafar definitely works much more directly on this than I do, but, um, but I definitely think about that, especially in my teaching. Um, but also, I mean, my hope is that, uh, you know, in, in doing the kind of research I do and, and publishing, and I always try to write in a way that is hopefully accessible. And, and I've heard that it's, you know, colleagues in the tech industry have in some cases read some of my stuff and said, oh yeah, I use that to argue for this particular kind of program or, or to push back against this technology proposal. And whenever I hear stories like that, I'm always so heartened because that's kind of, at the end of the day, that's one of my big goals for doing this kind of work, right? To, to try to, to make the world a little bit better place in whatever way I can. Um, and I would say that, you know, ultimately there are, um, just really recognizing the people behind a lot of what goes on online. I mean, I think of all of the labor of content moderation, the labor of teaching that we're, that I think we're all kind of living right now, um, or anyone doing, you know, taking classes or teaching classes um, online. Um, there is, you know, all of that labor has kind of become much more apparent once again. So I, I would, 
yeah, I, I would say that, you know, I hope that, um, that some, some of these lessons can continue to be carried forward. Sorry, I'll, I'll hand over to uh, either Kimuko or uh, Nilofar if they want to add anything. I want to add something, then I just have one, one question for each, of, for each of you to answer. This is hopefully a, a, a blue sky positive one. Um, this is, if you had unlimited reserve, relatively unlimited resources um, uh, to work with, uh, what's the big ambitious question that you would want to try to work to answer? Any, any, any uh, I'll go because uh, my answer is actually really relevant to the last question. Um, I would like to um, increase our understandings of how to make socio-technical systems and how to design them such that they actually you know, make increase our understandings of, um, you know, our relationships to each other, trust towards each other, empathy, and our feelings of responsibility towards each other. So I would like to understand how can we do that better? Boy, if I could fund you, I would. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Nico or Morgan, any ideas? Well, and certainly Nilofar's uh, NSF grants, you know, attest to, <laughs> to their faith in her to, to address these sorts of things. Um, I, I think I might just add, I would really love to, um, you know, to be able to kind of surface alternate histories of the tech world. And I think there are some great historians who have been doing this, but there has been so much placed on these kind of hero narratives and the, you know, the Steve Jobses of the world and such. And I really want to, you know, do everything I can to kind of invert that and say, here's stuff that really happened, right? I'm not making it up, but things that we generally conveniently ignore because they don't fit our kind of preconceived notions and our narratives about the like the lone hero inventor or whatever it might be, which tend to, you know, be fairly racist and be fairly sexist and, and reinscribe many of the same problems that uh, currently plague the industry. So, um, so that would be my big blue sky <laughs> uh, goal. Excellent. You want to add anything to that, Kimiko? Do you have a? Yeah, I, I agree with all that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, in the uh, spirit of supporting um, women, um, I would love to um, have an opportunity to support more of the. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm in the middle of, I'm sorry, again, the, the domestic, <laughs> domestic interruption. Um, support more of the um, female, um, um, you know, young girls um, programs and, and how to also trace that over, over um, a longer period of time um, to do a, um, longitudinal studies. And so, thank, yeah. you, thank you, Kimiko. Kimiko has two young children and this is one of the problems, the burdens that women face in, in this world, in the COVID world especially. Listen, thanks to all three of you, Nilafar, Morgan, and Kaniko. That was truly fascinating. I'm so honored to be a colleague. Um, before I hand this back to Steve, I want to say one more uh, thing about the women of South Hall. We have not mentioned yet the staff women. Our staff, if you come to South Hall, the staff are largely women, and they are amazing. I want to, uh, the, the women who put this thing together, this event together, Shanti, Tia, Amy, and Christy, you know, bravo, thank you to you, and thank you to all of the rest of you. Uh, I, I started to make a list and then I realized it was just too long to read all the names of the, the wonderful women staff, but we would not be in South Hall, I school would not be where it is without all of you as well. Okay, back to you, Steve. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Um, before I finish up, I just want to double down on what you said. Um, I think you want you actually once said to me that um, research and teaching is a service business, that we're actually doing it not for ourselves, we're doing it in service of others. And uh, maybe that's sort of like relevant to some of the things that Kamiko is showing in the VR environment as well. But uh, the staff is actually the heart and soul of what makes all that possible and makes that service possible. So double down on that, thanks. I've gained a really a deep new appreciation of that over the last couple of months. That I, as a regular faculty member, sometimes you just don't see what has to happen behind the scenes to make everything work the way it does. Um, I also just wanted to say two other really quick things. Um, first, just to, to kind of 
say for everybody that the kind of, the, the reason we ask ourselves questions like Anno asked, like what would you do if you could do anything is because the iSchool has, at least for the time I've been in my experience, and I have a feeling way back to the early days of setting up information system schools and librarianship schools, the ambition was to imagine that we could do some of those things. And without that ambition, um, we're not really reaching our potential. So I feel like the greatest thing, the greatest gift that we can give um, from the privileged position of working in a university is to actually you know, ask those really, really big questions that people in industry say, people in government, people who have sort of more constraints than we do in terms of what our research agendas can be. They don't have the opportunity to even try, and we do. So um, that's what we do, that's what we pride ourselves on. And uh, finally, just to kind of reflect on one other thing, I think Morgan said it was that um, the, the ambition there is not just about basic research so that we publish in peer reviewed journals for each other. It's about developing knowledge that people in the world can use to move the needle in ways that we think are right and good. And I just feel like, you know, listening to my colleagues talk, um, it always reminds me that this isn't just what people call ivory tower academic research. It is basic science, evidence-based ways to move the world in a better direction. And that's what we're all about. That's why the students come here. That's why faculty stay here. And I hope that's why the staff do what they do to make it possible because um, that's the mix that makes this place special. And I just wanted to say that out loud to everybody. Um, just a quick last, maybe kind of like backwards look at history. Uh, you know, Berkeley does have this incredible history. Um, this is a picture of Benjamin I. Wheeler. I believe that Wheeler Hall, right next to South Hall, is named after him. Um, he was the president of the university in 1918, um, kind of an iconic figure on the campus. Um, I think folks know there is this um, Wheeler, Benjamin uh, I. Wheeler Society. Uh, individuals sometimes have um, given support to that society for the future. Um, there's the Light the Way campaign, which similarly reflects a sort of long history of Berkeley trying to um, bring light to somewhat sort of shaded parts of society, shaded parts of science, shaded parts of the world we live in. And um, it wouldn't be right for me to stop without thanking everybody on this call um, for those contributions. Um, it makes a huge difference to the functioning of a public university to have an engaged alumni base that can help with that kind of support. And for us, it feels like that mission is just couldn't be more important going forward. And so um, I am always reminded that I am supposed to use the phrase fiat lux. And I don't know really what it stands for, except light the way. And that actually does feel really relevant and really important and really actually quite indicative of what I feel like we're trying to do at South Hall, what the campus Berkeley is trying to do and uh, what our alumni community needs to be and we hope will continue to be a part of. So, um, Maybe we'll just end it with that. Um, I think we have a Zoom link for people who want to uh, do the photo opportunity. Uh, Amy's just put that in the, um, in the, uh, in the chat box. And uh, yeah, finally, let me just say the obvious. Look, we got through the last pandemic in 1918 or our predecessors did. Um, the world suffered and came out better on the other side. And uh, I am absolutely, 100% convinced that when this pandemic ends, the iSchool, the campus is gonna be better for it. We're not just sitting here saying, let's kind of like work our way through this and just kind of get to the other side so we can go back to the way things were. Everybody I know is asking themselves, how can we use this crisis as an opportunity to come out stronger on the other side? That's, that's our mission. And uh, that's what we're intending to do and that's what we're committed to do. So um, please, um, everybody stay well, stay safe, stay in touch with us. We wanna stay in touch with you. Um, our alumni community is like a distributed sensor network out there in the world telling us what we need to be thinking about, what we need to be working on. And we don't get the value of that unless you call us and email us um, and eventually come see us and tell us what you're thinking too. So um, with that, again, um, thanks to everyone and particularly for the folks who organized this. Um, I think we might have missed Gary Lum as one other person who was really crucial in making the technology work. So thank you, Gary. Great. And uh, particularly thank you, Kamiko, Anno, Nilafar, and Morgan for those great talks.
and uh, we'll see everyone hopefully soon in person.